So this is the strange world we dwell in, with a lot of people still feeling that this isn't really a serious threat to their futures at all, and some people, of course, understanding that this is a civilization-threatening moment in the history of humankind. So how do we deal with this? How do we remain optimistic against a backdrop of that kind? Do we have an obligation to remain optimistic? Could we be really effective advocates of change without having some kind of residue of optimism in our advocacy? I shall ask you later whether you can tell me of any proven examples of really serious, life-changing leadership that was premised entirely on threatening people with Armageddon. It's quite difficult to find historical examples of this. So I'm wrestling with this more and more, and I'm going to try and share with you what I think is emerging as a sort of way of handling the psychodynamics of optimism in an age of apocalypse. Basically, as I read it now, there are three persuasions that people are adopting when it comes to coping with this dilemma. I'm not talking about people who don't think there's a problem, OK? Because I don't think there are many of them here tonight. So this is people who accept there's a problem. And they fall into three camps. The first is what I call the Lovelockian school of optimism, which is the world is going to be a much better place in two or three hundred years, largely because we will have seen the death of around five billion people. This is a most idiosyncratic form of optimism. And when you actually invite Jim to share it with you, he is quite serious about it, because his philosophical perspective is not that of most people who come from a humanist persuasion. It is essentially a philosophical premise based on his understanding of life on Earth, writ large, not just human life on Earth. And he is genuinely persuaded that it will be a very good thing if about five billion of us die. I'm not sure many people find that kind of optimism very easy to embrace. And I think you probably have to be a bit of a special person like Jim Lovelock to get away with it. I'm not sure we could carry that off very easily. The second school of thought is what I refer to as the where is the Pearl Harbor moment, which will enable politicians to go on to a war footing. So these are people who sort of despair of conventional democratic processes, sort of despair away about the way in which markets operate, sort of despair about the ability of individual citizens all over the world to respond to this challenge at an appropriate level, at the scale that we're talking about now. And for those people, the only thing that will stand in the way of us going into that apocalyptic future is a perception that this is at least the equivalent of any crisis we faced at any time of war before, and that we have to address it in those terms. Going on to war, war footing for politicians is an immensely complicated process. It isn't basically something that fills people with a huge sense of excitement. All sorts of really difficult words like rationing come into play, control, constraints, setting democratic freedoms to one side in the interests of the greater good. So optimism emerging from a war footing analysis is also quite difficult because it doesn't really play to our sense of seeking the best from humankind, from the societies in which we live. So Lovelockian optimism seems impossible. War footing optimism seems undesirable if we could do it differently, which leaves us with the third variety, which are those who still argue that we have quotes, a window of time, quotes. I'm in this camp. My window is of variable proportions, depending on what particular pessimistic or optimistic mood I'm in at that time, or what has been passing across my desk, or going into my mind, whatever it might be. But I am persuaded that there is a window of a given size which enables us to come through this period and out the other side of that window into a better world. That's my sole residual claim to realistic optimism. So were my window to close definitively, 
as a consequence of the science of climate change just getting worse and worse as fast as it seems to be doing now, I would be in a state of psychological meltdown. Because without my window, I wouldn't really know how to cope with the despair that would be the automatic response to thinking it was too late to do anything about it. So, I invite you to think where you are on that spectrum. Are you all still persuaded we have a window? Has your window already shut? Are you waiting for the war footing moment to arrive? The Pearl Harbor climate induced scale natural disaster? I won't start talking about Miami now because I've done that too often, but normally when I think about this, I do think about the destruction of Miami. It just comes naturally into my mind as the sort of appropriate level of climate induced disaster to get people to change their mind. Or have you already perhaps reluctantly lurched into a state of Lovelockian despair stroke optimism with the prospect of five billion people dying over the course of the next 200 years, whatever it might be. So where are you on that spectrum? You can't not be on it. You can't decide not to have a view about that. Because your view about that will determine the way in which you perform as a sustainable development activist, as a person seeking to change behavior in society, in your organization, in your own life, in the lives of your nearest and dearest, whatever it might be. You sort of need to know what the psychological foundation is on which you commit to that ongoing advocacy. So having invited you to hope that there's still a window, a time window, which is still open, which will allow us to do this, obviously then one moves on to think about what resources we would need to deploy to ensure that society took advantage of that available time period to avoid the collapse into this climate-induced apocalypse, runaway, irreversible climate-induced apocalypse. And I suppose for all of us at this stage, we begin to play with who are the agents of change? Where is the energy for this process really going to come from? Who is going to marshal this quality of leadership to enable us collectively in different societies to take advantage of that diminishing period of time to arrive at a rather better prospect for humankind? Where is that leadership going to come from? And obviously, from our perspective in Forum for the Future, we spend a lot of time trying to work out where the real leadership offer lies. Is it in government? Is it in business in the private sector? Is it in civil society? Is it elsewhere, perhaps, in faith groups or religious communities in a way that we often don't take account of? And when you start doing that analysis, it's really quite tricky to hope that the window is going to stay long enough for us to take advantage of it. Because from a government perspective, it's hard really to see how they're going to change the quality of the leadership that they bring to bear on these issues today. Many of you, I imagine, will be as sad and struck with consternation at the fact that governments all over the world can marshal seemingly limitless resources to sort out the collapse in our capital markets using a wonderful phrase, whatever it takes for as long as it takes. Isn't that just the most amazing phrase? Kind of confirming moral jeopardy for taxpayers forever into the indefinite future. Whatever it takes for as long as it takes. When do you think the first politician will utter those words, whatever it takes for as long as it takes, in the context of accelerating climate change, resource scarcity issues, and so on. Difficult to sort of see that one coming, really. Hard to think of the journey that individual politicians would have to go through to give it that degree of salience, that degree of political leadership. 